Hey, good afternoon. This is uh, Ryan English, the CEO of Flymotion. Uh, appreciate those of you from around the world joining us on this very exciting uh, first webinar on the Matrice 300 RTK and Zenmuse H20 series drone. I uh, just want to make a quick introduction. Um, you'll be hearing more from them, but uh, we have uh, Jeremy Hyatt from the, uh, our technical lead from Flymotion. We have uh, Rich Gatanis, the UAS operations manager at Flymotion. And also joining us is Romeo Dersher, the senior director of public safety for DGI. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining us on this webinar. And I'm super excited actually to talk about this platform. It's, uh, it's been a long time coming. So there it is. And uh, I will let the experts we have on here talk about it. Jeremy, if uh, you want to go ahead and uh, go over the basic specifications. Uh, thanks, uh, Rich and Romeo, for being on here. So we're going to go ahead and just jump right in. Um, it is a brand new platform, some awesome things about it, but there are a ton of new specs to go over. So uh, let's jump right into the first slide, uh, superior performance here. So I know we're going to touch on a lot of stuff. Um, I know most of you have already been watching tons of videos. You've been watching our videos. Um, so you will, might have heard some of this stuff, but we definitely would like to clear up some things that we've been hearing, a um, little bit of misinformation going around. So uh, first off, we'll start with the amazing mission duration, uh, increased by 140%, uh, total of 55 minute max flight time. Now that is without a payload, uh, but that is still a amazing flight time with that new FPV. You still get a ton of information. Um, if you're looking at a payload configuration, XT2 Z30, something like 15 minutes. Uh, and if you're gonna be using the new H20T, H20 series, you're looking more like a 36 minute uh, flight time. The drone does come bundled with a fast charging station. The TV60s are massive batteries. They're, they're gonna give you that crazy flight time. Um, this charging station will hold up to eight. It'll charge two simultaneously. Uh, I think that it'll charge full uh, within 70 minutes. It does also charge your WB37s. It can hold four of those. Um, and from what I understand, you can also push firmware updates through um, the station there, which is uh, something we remember back from the TV50 charging station. So this is really nice to see this come back. Um, very, very convenient. With the new system, we do have a bit of a new OcuSync, the OcuSync Enterprise. Um, our transmission distance is pretty crazy. 15 kilometers or about 9.3 miles. Um, and we have increased, DJI has increased the video channel support. So now we have a total of three instead of the two max before. Um, the drone does have a maximum pay takeoff weight of 19.84 uh, pounds, about 20 pounds. Um, and it can, uh, has a payload capacity of up to six pounds. Now, obviously that's, you gotta carry the batteries in there. Um, and like I had touched on a minute ago, you do have the triple gimbal support. Uh, with the multiple payload configurations. So as you can see here, we've got the two uh, dual gimbal on the front. Now, most of you have probably seen the uh, M300 has a single gimbal. The dual gimbal is not a separate platform like we've seen before. Uh, it's gonna be an, a, kind of an adapter that you can get uh, and change out the single gimbal for a double gimbal and then add the top on the, the top gimbal. Um, so here we're gonna touch on the H20 series, H20 and H20T. I'm gonna let Romeo talk for a little bit about the zoom capability of this. Uh, as he's very familiar, he understands a lot about this. So Romeo, you wanna touch on this for me? Thank you, Jerome. Um, it's it's definitely great to see these new payloads that, that have come to market with the M300. And uh, both of them have the zoom capabilities included. Both have a wide camera, both have the zoom capability. Um, the, uh, H20T also has the thermal. And if we're looking a little bit at the zoom uh, capabilities, it's important to understand a couple of things. Number one, the zoom camera, um, now it has 20 megapixels. So it's a, it's a very high res zoom camera. And the, the uh, vocal length in essence is 31.7 to 556 millimeters. However, because we have the wide camera as well, which is a, a focal length of, of 24 millimeters, we can go from, from 24, which is pretty wide, to then 556, which is fairly narrow and zoomed in. Mm -hmm. And that is what we call that hyper zoom capabilities. So 
it, it, it's, it's kind of a combination of going between the white camera sensor and then into the zoom camera. Uh, so it's quite fascinating and it's, it's extremely helpful because your white view stays as is. Uh, while then when you zoom in with your zoom portion, uh, you can get closer to that object and at any given time you can quickly switch back and see the wide view and that is a tremendous benefit. Yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, just from our initial testing, this has been something that's kind of changed the way that I feel whenever I'm zooming in. You know, a lot of times zooming in, you're 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 getting much closer to an object, you're getting a lot of detail, but you feel I feel like I'm losing that situational awareness closer to me around my drone. Um, but I can switch back and forth. And so that definitely allows me to feel like I know what's around me. I can switch quickly um, and stay close. Um, so this, uh, what we're seeing here um, is a bit of the new H20 series. Um, so little tidbit there, you know, the UI is different, uh, allows, like you're saying, switching between that zoom uh, and the wide angle. Right after this slide, I think we're gonna show you a quick little clip that shows a smart track um, we're zoomed in, as you can see, you got a five times zoom. We switched to the wide, um, so you know you can clearly see, and then we switched to the, the thermal and back. Um, bit of a quick video there, but uh, essentially what you're seeing is that easily switching from the workflows there. I need thermal, I need wide, I need to zoom in. Um, and so I think now we'll be moving on to the next section. And so, uh, you know, safety and reliability. This is a big deal, big deal with DJI. It's a big deal for, uh, you know, the, all the the demographic that we work with and uh, keeping these, you know, tools in the air, keeping them safe is a big deal. And uh, so with the six directional sensing, one of the things I really like about this, obviously we've seen visual sensing in many of DJI platforms and other platforms, uh, that's not necessarily new, but what I think is really awesome is the customizability of the distance you can break. So me as a competent pilot, maybe I need to get really close to something to inspect, or I need to fly closely between two pillars, um, but the normal obstacle avoidance wouldn't allow me. Well, now I can go in, take the responsibility, lower that braking, and allow myself to fly through. A um, Couple other points to talk on. I know there's a beacon on the top and the bottom now, and there are also auxiliary lighting for the top and the bottom. So low light or night flight, um, I think you're gonna be a little bit safer. Um, we DJI has increased the IP rating. Um, we tested this, we literally sprayed it while it was flying with a pressure washer. Um, I think most everyone has probably seen the video by now of it being tested uh, with the rainwater. Um, so that's a really nice key feature we like to see. Uh, previous platforms have much, you know, much more issues flying in inclement weather. Um, yeah, and you can see down there, you know, 3.94 uh, inches per rain a day. One of the big things that I like uh, about the new system, uh, the new Smart Controller Enterprise, is this HMS, the health management system. From a tech support side, from a knowledge side, uh, this is very important. I think that uh, it's a very clear way to see any errors, any issues uh, with, you, with your system, and then at the same time, be able to fix them yourself or troubleshoot them yourself or learn more about what's going on. Um, and obviously you have other quality of life things there, flight log management, firmware management. Um, the error records and the troubleshooting guidelines to me is like, that's a big deal. I really enjoy that. I think that's a very smart thing to have put in there. Um, and, you know, like any RTK system, uh, we do have redundant systems. Um, you're going to see a dual IMU, dual barometer, dual compass, dual RTK antennas, which are the big round ones in the back. Um, and then just like the other pay or other platforms, you can do tool, dual control. This is a little bit different. Uh, you have to use two of the smart controller enterprises. Um, there's a training mode, which I think is interesting, allowing a pilot to learn some maneuvers, learn something new, while a more advanced pilot can take control whenever he needs to. Um, and then same thing as before, maybe I'm piloting and Rich is uh, doing my camera for me. You know, I, I need to focus on where my bird is and he can do the camera work for me. Um, and then another redundancy is the dual battery. Obviously like the M210 series, you do have to do two batteries, but this series, if one fails, you can still land safely with the other one. Uh, going on, more redundancy, we do have the three propeller emergency landing. Um, and then like I touched on before, extra wide FPV camera. This, I, I, I don't know, I just like it. It's a quality of life thing that I think is really interesting and really nice. Now, ADS view receiver, oh, go ahead, Romeo. One thing to add on here is um, this new camera 
is, is very wide and it's beautiful. Uh, you get a nice view, uh, very wide. But what you can't do is before you were able to point the camera straight down on the FPV side. This is now a fixed camera inside the body. So you have just the lens that peeks out of the body. So therefore you can't utilize the FPV camera to look straight down. So if you need that straight down view, you would obviously then uh, switch over or add a, a payload view and, and just gimbal that camera sensor down uh, if you needed that feature. But it's it's like Jeremy said, it's fantastic to have that wide view in, in very high res. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think it's a really important you know point to touch on. Uh, the camera, although amazing, it doesn't do everything. It looks great. The up, the, you know, the UI is incredible. But like you're saying, can't point it up, can't point it down. Um, Got to use your payloads on there for that. Uh, I do think one important thing to touch on is the ADS-B receiver. Obviously, we've seen this on DJI platforms already, but I have heard a couple things, watched a couple videos, people saying that other aircraft can see this, uh, see this bird, you can see this drone. Um, that's not true. It's a receiver only, um, which you know is that goes by our the way the FAA wants it. We see and avoid, right? They don't need to see us because we can see them and we can get out of the way. Um, but I just wanted to clear that up. It is a receiver only. All right, this is uh, Ryan again. One thing I wanted to uh, just make sure everybody uh, that's in attendance knows is uh, questions are open at any time. So go, go ahead and submit your questions. Um, we're gonna be addressing and answering those at the end. Um, we also have a, a, a poll uh, section on there. So uh, those of you that are asking about uh, pricing, things like that, um, that will all be sent out at the end of the webinar. Um, we also uh, are doing a live flight demo that will follow uh, this webinar, and that's going to go on to Facebook and Instagram Live. So uh, we'll have a we'll have a QR code that you can scan at the end uh, that we'll be able to uh, take you there. So uh, next up, we've got uh, Romeo Dersher, Senior Director of Public Safety for DJI. And uh, thanks, Romeo, for joining us. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan, Rich, Jerome, and the entire Fly Motion team. Um, thank you all of you too for joining us uh, on this on this webinar. Uh, it's it's really really amazing to see the progression of uh, the technology. Uh, I, I have been with DJI close to six years, and my focus has really been almost five years on the public safety side. So really building the uh, tools that we have today over the time. And it's not just DJI, it's an entire ecosystem that has contributed to it. And here's a little bit of a, of a timeline. There is one key point that is missing on here. And I, uh, I asked the team to look into that. That's 2014, because in 2014, we released the SDK, the Software Development Kit. And that is a fundamentally important moment in time because for the first time, third party software applications were able to be built and then run on our platforms. And thanks to that, uh, we have so many additional solutions out there uh, from, from you know, mapping to the way we do streaming um, to the way we, we do AR integration. So, uh, the SDK definitely in 2014 uh, was that big uh, piece that made a lot available that we that we do today. Uh, with the SDK also came the M100, which was kind of like the the testing platform for those developers. Um, another very important time was 2016, uh, close to the, uh, the beginning of 2016, the Z um, the Z30 was was released and the XT, the first thermal camera. So as you can see, the progressions are, are starting. And back in those days, we had a single uh, camera that we were flying. And so if you had an Inspire One, you had to pick and choose. Do you want to fly a thermal camera? Do you want to fly a visible light camera? And we realized that there is a need to have both at the same time because you don't necessarily want or need to change uh, uh, or time to change these, these sensors. So already at that time, we started to think about what can we do in order to facilitate multiple sensors on one aircraft. And in, in 2018, the X-T2, the second generation of the thermal camera came out. And for the first time, we had 
two sensors in one payload. We had the visible light and we had the thermal in one. And that allowed us to do much additional things in the back end, like having thermal and visible light right next to each other on the screen so you can see. Because another thing we learned was when you're flying full screen thermal, as you had to do back in the days with the original XT, your brain is not used to seeing your environment in all these different palettes. And so oftentimes operators would lose situational or orientational awareness. And if they had to explain what they were looking at, it was difficult because they couldn't see everything. They couldn't see all the outlines. And that was another reason why MSX was built or a little bit of that uh, visible light is overlaid on top of the thermal so we can get additional details out of it. And then moving forward, uh, we got into the smaller Mavic 2 Enterprise platform sizes that were uh, enhancing operations because now you had a smaller uh, quick deploy platform while you were getting the larger platform ready and, and you could just enhance the current operations uh, with that smaller platform. Obviously, version two of the uh, M200 series came out and uh, last year we did the, the, the P4 multi-spectral uh, platform. So this is a, a, a wonderful progression. And what we're seeing today is that we have a payload that now has more than two sensors in it. We, we have a wide angle camera, we have a zoom camera, we have a thermal camera, and we have a laser rangefinder. So we're now talking about four different sensors in essence that are on one payload. And that is extremely fantastic because it increases the opportunities to utilize all these different sensors and the data behind it in ways that we were not able to do before. And one thing I want to make clear is we're still early on with like the laser rangefinder, for example, and, and Rich and I will talk about that a little bit later too. We have gotten so much feedback about how helpful it would be to have that feature built in and knowing public safety and knowing some of the other verticals, they will come up with use cases that today we haven't even thought about. And that to me is the exciting part. You make something new available where the market has asked for and the market will help create use cases that then will allow us and the ecosystem to build upon. And that's the progression that we're going through right now. And that is extremely exciting. So enough about the history. What else do we have here? Um, on the next slide, obviously safety has also increased dramatically over the last uh, few years. And if we go back in time, another moment in time that's very important is when DJI decided we need to do geofencing. And it made at the time so much sense, and it still makes sense today, because geofencing is one way for us to help our customers understand the airspace that they're operating in. And that's extremely helpful on the hobbyist side, because, you know, especially we guys, we, we tend to go to the store, we buy a new technology, a new tool, a new gadget, we don't read the instructions and we don't really worry about anything else that's out there. So we just put the batteries in and we do whatever we do. Well, with geofencing, we were really able to help uh, the first time users or even more professional users getting a better idea of the environment they're in. And then once we started seeing uh, enterprise commercial uses of the drones, we had to start adapting to the fact that hey, this police department or this fire department or this utilities inspection may actually have proper approval to fly in a controlled airspace, like around an airport. So we have to create solutions so that these entities can get unlocked. And we have wrote this out it's on the public safety side, the quality Qualified Entities Program, where public safety entities can get fully unlocked. So as long as they have a 107, as long as they have a COA, and they understand that they have to operate and they take responsibility and ensuring that they are flying in controlled airspace with approvals, um, with proper communications, their aircraft get, gets unlocked. And also we, we had included altitude limits so that at 
you know, that 400 foot mark, um, operators will get notification that, hey, you've reached the ceiling. Um, we, we also have taken those off on the QEP program. So uh, in a public safety scenario, if you have fully unlocked aircraft, you can fly uh, beyond, beyond those that 400 foot ceiling from takeoff point. Extremely important when you do, let's say, a search and rescue operation in, 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 a, in a mountain environment, and you're taking off down in the valley, and you're flying up a mountainside, um, you're always, you know, more than 400 feet above the ground on compared to where the drone is over that mountain slope. But from your takeoff location, you may now be a thousand feet off the ground. And so we had to compensate for that uh, by taking those off. Uh, flight distance warnings, very important. We're a big supporter of remote ID. We truly believe that remote ID is needed. It's that license, electronic license plates in the, in this, in the sky, in essence so that um, there's more transparency and people operate uh, in, in, in a more uh, potentially responsible way because there is that transparency factor. And also AirSense is a very, very big uh, safety feature that the team has worked very hard in getting established. And, and as Jerome said, it is a receiver only. As a operator of uh, unmanned aerial vehicle, it is your responsibility to yield to a, to a crewed aircraft. And so the, the ability for you to see what is in your environment is tremendously helpful. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have one of these big jetliners that goes, you know, two miles above you, but you still get that notification that an aircraft is close by. Uh, some people say, oh, that's more distracting than it's helpful. Um, my view on that is I would rather know than not knowing. And uh, if if I have a, a, I should have a spotter with me and, and if I can ask the spotter to quickly look up and make sure that the aircraft that supposedly is flying right over me is really not that close, then, you know, it, it's just better data for me. And obstacle sensing, I think we have taken this to do to another level right now with all the various sensors that are available. Uh, to really scan the environment and adjust as you need it. If you need to get closer to an object that you may be inspecting, you have the ability to do that. Obviously, with a zoom camera that has 20 megapixels, the, the uh, capabilities in, 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 in imagery, you may not need to fly that close. You may actually now be able to keep your safe distance, zoom in, and with some of the features that we have added on the back end, it will really, really make your job easier. Uh, obviously, the password protection on the data of your uh, aircraft is another one of those big ones. Uh, if you choose, as an operator, there's a lot of miscommunication and lots of mis misinformation out there. If you are an operator of a, one of our DJI drones, if you don't do anything, your data is not going anywhere but your SD card. or if you choose to stream it to one of your servers or use a streaming solution that you're choosing, then it goes also wherever you specify. There is nothing going outside anywhere, except when you choose to sync your flight logs. When you sync your flight logs, let's say you have two uh, platforms and you want to have one flight log for both. There is a feature where you can sync, and that goes onto a, a US-based AWS server, so it can be synced. Obviously, it has to go somewhere. If you have multiple devices, it has to go somewhere, so it gets a central point, so it can be all added up. And that's a US-based AWS server. Uh, we also have local data mode. If you put local data mode in, it puts an additional barrier between the DJI platform and a smart device that you may be using uh, and that may have Wi-Fi or LT 4G connectivity, it breaks that by software default. So it's an additional layer uh, so that you can ensure no data is going anywhere. Uh, Flight Hub is now on Azure, and obviously we have 256A AES encryption on our uh, comms link. So over the years, we have really put a lot of effort into enhancing safety and security, and we're not done yet. There is more that we will be working on and in the future. And as an industry, uh, we also need proper uh, standards so that not only DJI, but all manufacturers can work and meet those defined standards.
So we, we are as transparent as, as we want to be, despite, despite the contrary uh, reports that are out there. Uh, we have validated these processes and we will continue to work on increasing both safety and security as we go with new features, with new opportunities. Hey, this is Ryan again. Um, so I wanted to uh, introduce uh, Rich Gatanis from the Fly Motion team. He's going to be joining uh, Romeo here on the next set of slides. I also just wanted to remind everybody that the live flight demo that is going to be on Facebook and Instagram Live is going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It will follow uh, this webinar. Uh, we are going to uh, say goodbye to Jeremy uh, as he goes and gets prepared uh, with our other staff for the live flight demo. So uh, thanks a lot, Jeremy, for being on this webinar. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Rich and Romeo. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, it was uh, really awesome talking about the M300 with you guys. And um, have a good one. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Jeremy, Romeo, uh, thanks for coming on this with us today, guys. Um, I'm gonna kinda set these two to side by side. I know there's been a lot of comparisons out there. Um, and you know, and Romeo, feel free to interject if you got some other information too. But we wanted to do some side by side comparisons first before we jump into specific use cases. But uh, some, so if you guys wanna see what it looks like compared to the M M200. Um, and then uh, also some of the pros and cons of each different system. So we're gonna kinda jump through a few of these. As you can see in this uh, particular slide, um, the M300 is a little bit larger. I wouldn't say it's it's huge comparatively, but it's taller and it's a little bit wider on the on the wingspan. Um, the the nice thing is the rotors do collapse on this one and they do stay permanently on the aircraft. Um, that's also a, a one of the downsides is the fact that it's a little more of a work if you needed to get one of the rotors off. Um, so that one's um, a little bit of a challenge. The rotors though, I do what I like about the rotors is they are quieter. So when you're flying the system, just because of the, the larger rotor, it makes less noise. So it's a lower uh, uh, pitch or decibel level. So the, you don't have to get quite as far away to be able to not hear it. Um, I know like some some guys or folks were asking if, if you can go into complete, um, uh, what's the word, Romeo, for uh, shutting off all the lights on the system so you can be... Um, uh, dark mode. Yes, dark mode. So you can do that. All the lights on this one, even all the way down to the power light, which on the previous systems wouldn't um, um, shut off, but this one does. You can go completely dark on this system, which is really cool too. Um, the setup on them, this one's a little bit cumbersome uh and and when we go uh to do some other future videos we're going to show you guys some different ways that you can unbox this taken out of the the, the uh the case makes it much simpler but it is kind of cumbersome the way it sits in the case that it comes in uh so there there's a there's a challenge to unboxing that but you can see side by side there they kind of have the same height profile i would say the 300 sits a few inches higher than the uh, the 200 uh but uh, you know, side by side, it, it does have a little bigger fo footprint. So you're going to need a little more room when you're setting up your LZs. Um, it's 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 a lot bigger in that in that sense too. So, um, and then the, I, I would say one of the biggest differences here that I, I actually appreciate is you know the the sentence control is is was always pretty solid, but it was a lot of stuff I couldn't use on it. It was a big controller. It got heavy over time. And those of you that flown multiple flights uh, on a scene for a long period of time the controller became a, a big issue you were setting it down or you had to use a harness the uh the new uh enterprise smart controller is uh is pretty impressive it's so lightweight it has its own slot for wb37 battery also so it can stay charged longer it even comes with a harness too for this one but it's it's a just a neck harness you don't need much it's just it's barely noticeable compared to the, the setup on the uh the uh the sentence controller so i think that's a a huge plus in the new uh the new setup as you can see here we we have the two cases that's a, a gpc case next to the dji uh, m300 case and we used uh, desmond as a little bit of a scale for you so you can see when it comes to traveling and whatnot um the case uh can move you know it, it's a little bit taller about the same uh, width, um, but uh, it can carry. Uh, if we go to the next slide, you'll see the inside of it. They, um, the 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 aircraft can carry four of the 
uh, TB60 batteries in it. You put two in the aircraft and two in the slots there. Um, it can carry two controllers. I think it can pretty much carry everything you need in the DJI case, which is nice. Before we had to purchase another case to be able to carry all our gear. This case seems to fit exactly what you're looking for. Uh, with the exception of the battery case, which I don't have in this slide, the battery case is the charging case for this system now, which there's a lot of questions too, whether you need, if there's another type of charger, you can charge one battery or two batteries at a time. Charging case is the only way to charge the batteries for this. Um, so that is another piece of this puzzle, but being in a Pelican style case, it's easy to uh, to, to transport with both of those. Um, but again, and that, you're only gonna get, I think uh, you can only get one sensor in there. Is that correct, Romeo? Yes, I believe so. At least on the on the version that I that I have, I have only uh, the ability for one sensor. Okay. One, one thing I do want to want to say in, in regards to the cases, obviously that was also big feedback that that we have gotten over time that our the cases should become you know better. Obviously, uh, for example, what what Go Professional is doing with their cases, it's fantastic because it makes it much more customizable to the needs. Of, of customers and I don't foresee this ever going away because uh, for many our case may be appropriate enough but for a lot of the other uh, use cases they may want to have something a little bit more larger or differently laid out and so uh, I'm pretty sure we will soon be seeing uh, additional solutions come out in regards to cases and that is good because that's again that that ecosystem but at least for right now, um, we have a much better uh, case system for not only the platform itself, but then also for the battery station. And you brought up a very important point, Rich, and that is the fact that um, for the very first time we're doing something different. We have a dedicated uh, charging solution um, that goes with the aircraft. Before, we had a, a, a small charger, uh, as you remember, maybe on the M200, you had that that cylinder type of charger where you had the four flaps that come down you to put your your batteries in. And if if you're like in a vehicle driving to an to a location and over a speed bump and your battery got disconnected from the charger, it it was just not a very um, in the field type of solution. And that was one of the things that we wanted to do different here, where we had this dedicated charging dock that has additional uh, f features and functionalities, but to also easier transport your batteries, store your batteries, and obviously charge your batteries. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, and and I will say too, that's one of the uh, the things that I've been really excited about. I know the M210, I think was, or the two, uh, M200 series was a uh, first dive for DJI into uh, public safety or, or any kind of um, industrial type of platforms and it, you know that was a use a good usable system and the, the leaps that, that's been made to get to this system i think is is very impressive because of all the types of the questions that we've had and issues that we've had in the past it seems like they're definitely making an effort to uh, listen to what we're saying what we're asking for and they're, they're putting that to to work so uh, it's been pretty pretty exciting to see this system like that and then that, that's one of the big takeaways that we've had about it um can we go to the next slide there please all right, so actually this one's going to be, uh, oh, this one's you, right, Romeo? Is that right? Uh, it's, like, it's like a little bit of both of us. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're yeah. gonna, I see which one we're on now. <laughs> I think this is going to be like a, a lively discussion. So one of the exciting things is that we have a much better, uh, you know, we call it the primary flights display. The, 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 yeah, yeah, the interface, user interface. Exactly. And so... A lot more information is made available to you, and it mimics more the crude man craft type of uh, environment. Um, so, if we want to walk through a couple of these items, so right now we're we're, we're looking through uh, the the FPV camera, and as you can see, it's it's pretty wide, and it gives us uh, a lot of information. So, one thing that's new is that compass rose on the bottom, center bottom. And on there, we have a lot of information. So for example, we see that north is at approximately two o'clock. Um, so we have a full uh, rose and we're flying right now with that green uh, little triangle at uh, 321 degrees. So that is already great information. If we continue pushing forward 
the way we're keeping our sticks, that's where the aircraft is going. Uh, we're also seeing right below that orange little, uh, whatever, trapeze. I think it's also, a, yeah, maybe another triangle, it's hard to tell, but. Yes, so that one will indicate your gimbal view. So when you move your, your camera, uh, that will move in relation to what forward is of the drone. So that's another very, very helpful uh, feature. Now then, looking a little bit below, you start seeing these, these um, light orange or yellow um, things pop up and you see a cross, a little darker cross area. So let's talk about that little darker cross area. And in the center, you have a red triangle. And the red triangle, obviously, is your aircraft. And in regards to your aircraft, the pointy part is front, again, and it's aligned with the 321 where it's going. And then you have those, those crosshairs, in essence. And that's actually an important feature or indication. That's your um, kind of blind spot. These sensors, even though we have sensors all around, there is a, a blind spot that is very narrow, and that's indicated here. Those, those uh, light yellow shapes that come in, that's what it's sensing now. And that, those are those pilers that we see on the side of the screen. We will have a, 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 a video that's gonna come up and that will show you how these, um, these objects are going through the image and tell you exactly um, what is happening. So maybe we wanna play that. Yeah, and while they're playing, I just wanna hit on it too, Romeo, is that this has always been a challenge for, for those of you that you know, who fly uh, in real world situations and stuff. It's always been a challenge trying to fly into or around objects, especially from a distance um, without a really good pilot. It's a difficult maneuver to make right there, what you're watching. And most guys probably wouldn't do it because they wouldn't feel comfortable with it. Being able to have this type of information on our screen, and that's you know one of the things I really like about the new display is all that information that I have on there at my fingertips uh, which we didn't have before. And you can see the uh, uh, objects, like Romeo's mentioning, the yellow shows up on the radar, we'll call it, so to speak, they're on the compass rose, and as it gets closer, it, it detects it, and you can see it following right around the aircraft and, and as it goes behind it. And then also, if you look in the center of the screen, you have your, your um, artificial horizon that also gives you indication on your tilt of the drone. So let's say it's, it's uh, fighting wind that is coming from from a direction and it bites into the wind, it will give you that, that indication. And if you then look on your um, left side of the screen, we see the speed. And then a little bit below, we see also the wind speed, WS. And it gives you also indication of how fast is the wind, in mm -hmm. essence, blowing against your aircraft. Obviously, when you're on the ground, it will not detect that because on the ground, the aircraft will be level with the ground. Um, it's an algorithm in, in, in the back end that calculates how the drone is leaning into the wind, uh, how much that wind is. Now, if we go to the right side of the screen, we have additional uh, data points that become available. Obviously, you have your altitude there in the center, ALT. Uh, right now, it's in meters, and that is from your takeoff location. Um, on the bottom of that, you have um, ASL, absolute. Uh, altitude and and also the vertical speed indication. Now uh, you see also on that right side a uh, yellow line that goes up and down with a uh, top and bottom red number and that is in essence the distance of objects below you as well as above you. And then we also have the return to home altitude uh, that is set on there. So uh, you have a lot more information, much easier available to you uh, in this uh, F, uh, PFD display. Yeah, and I just want to hit a couple things too. Again, as a as a, as a user, having my altitude was always difficult to find if I needed to, especially if I was getting washed out by something in the bottom with the white letters or white numbers. It was difficult sometimes to understand where I was at altitude wise. Having that right in the middle of the display like that, large letters, green, different color background. I think is, uh, I really like the way this display looks and all the amount of information I'm able to get. The, um, like you mentioned, the um, uh, obstacles that are above me and below me and their distance from my aircraft, again, love it. Huge piece of information there. 
Um, and this just uh, just so you're tracking though, do you have to be in the FPV view to get your uh, horizon and um, and all this type uh, information? Is that correct, Romeo? Yeah, so in the FPV view, you have all of this information available. If you're in your payload, you have your regular um, information. The, the, the idea here is um, if you're doing, for example, a dual operation, uh, the majority of time the, the, the pilot itself, he or she is on the FPV view. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the camera operator could be looking to the side, and that gets just more confusing. So here is really where we wanted to put the, the best information available uh, to the operator. So and if you're moving now uh, to a scene or to uh, an area of operation, um, very likely you would utilize this view because you have all the information. And once you get to location, then you can start uh, moving around into all your other uh, payload capabilities and, and zoom in and, and use thermal and do all of that. Yeah, and just a reminder, guys, uh, you know, here in a few minutes when we go live, we're going to show a lot of these features uh, live so you can see how that looks and what that what that looks like in real time. So uh, we'll have a little more time on that. But um, um, and, and the, the dual control, obviously, we, we hit on that a little bit. Um, the um, it's kind of got some pretty neat features to it that, um, you know, allows you to switch pilots back and forth and also to be able to do a handoff from one pilot to another especially for long duration flights or, or long range flights um uh some other some other key features there um the takeoff and landing from point a which we just talked about and land on point b which is pretty neat then they have a trainer mode i think Ro, uh or i'm sorry jeremy mentioned that a little bit too which is kind of neat some some safety features built on that for the training mode um and then you also still have your traditional pilot and co-pilot which many of us uh you know have used uh, in the past so yeah and you know um another nice thing is we're, we're adding new features and capabilities uh again based on all of the feedback that we have received over over the many months and, and years and one of them is or a couple of them are the smart pin and tracking and, the, and that in point uh, location oftentimes you know we want to set a a a, a pin on a, uh, on a on an area of interest that is then visible um, to not only the USD operator but potentially others who are watching, and so that is the smart pin. And if, it's very easy to create that smart pin point. Uh, you utilize the way the laser rangefinder, um, and you you look at the area, you you select. Uh, to drop that pin, and it sets a pin not only visible in in your view, um, but also in on the map itself. It puts that, that that pin down, and maybe we can show a video of that. Uh, it's it's very good. It gives you the coordinates. So here is we're setting a pin now on that soccer field. Now, if you look at the at the display right now we see that there is a little diamond in the center frame and we're getting closer and closer to the diamond that particular diamond we can also see in the rows in that compass rows below as well as on the map uh, on the left it, it also indicates it now as you can see um it, i think the, the video will start all over again so right now we're again looking through the fpv camera um we see the diamond up ahead we're flying towards that diamond and it gives us all the information our altitude our speed and once we get to the location and we're gonna now set our aircraft into into position we're gonna switch over to a different uh, camera payload right as right now um now we can uh, start zooming in we see the, where the pin was set uh, we can do additional tasks now. So that's really a helpful feature, especially since that information then also can be shared uh, via Flight Hub, for example, to an incident command that is watching. Yeah, and just also keep in mind a lot of what you're seeing on here, uh, your altitude readings and your distances, those can all be switched to Imperial. Um, so you'll have miles, feet, and altitude and all that stuff too. So. And then we, we also continue to do the, the, the a smart track. The, the tracking feature, that's nothing new. Uh, we've had that in previous uh, uh, solutions. Uh, 
now we, we're just making it a little bit more uh, user friendly and also helpful. Uh, this obviously has a variety of different use cases. Uh, in, in this particular example, which is really just an example right now on, on, to indicate how this really would work in, 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 in real life, um, when, when you have the, the smart track on, it recognizes the moving objects. And if we want to then uh, track a particular object, uh, we click on, on that little outline and it then uses the camera uh, to focus on that piece so that that, in, that tracking object will be centered. And even though the aircraft stays in position, the camera will do the gimbal, adjust, um, and zoom in or zoom out depending on what needs to be done. So uh, you have the ability to keep that object uh, as centered as possible. And here is a, an example. There is a white vehicle coming. Um, we clicked on it. It's now in the center of the frame. The zoom camera is zooming out as, as the vehicle is closer to us. Uh, and it will continue to then zoom in. On the little rows below, you can see that yellow um, shape move in essence uh, from from almost 12 o'clock now to nine o'clock and that's our gimbal indicator so in, if we look at the center uh, red triangle we can we can see that our gimbal is at you know 9 30 uh, on a clock um, really helpful information because if I didn't have that I, I really would have had to remember that my aircraft is looking uh, almost 180 degrees the other way. So again, information that's very helpful. Now also what I want to show is that uh, because we're tracking that vehicle, we can see on your left the distance to that vehicle and its uh, GPS coordinates. And if we, can we play this video again, please? And if we play it again, you can see how the coordinates and how the distances um, uh, are, are changing based on, uh, what's happening. So the, the vehicle is coming closer, so it's getting closer and closer to the, uh, um, to the aircraft. And just about now it's at its closest point and it's moving away again. And we can see all of that thanks to the laser rangefinder and get the GPS coordinates of this as well. And uh, uh, Romeo, just real quick, uh, uh, if I'm not, if I'm correct, the, the laser is not visible light. You can't see that laser, correct? That's correct. It's uh, it's on the 905 uh, nanometer spectrum, so it's not a, a visible. Uh, it, it's in essence, it follows the same concept as other laser rangefinders that you may use in. I think right. don't you use one in golf, Rich? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> I can always see my ball. It's always in the middle of the fairway. Ah. Um, and then I also mentioned that uh, the pinpoint and 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 smart track can be also shared via, via the, the flight hub integration. So uh, if 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 you do set this uh, pinpoint, it will show up uh, in flight hub at your incident command uh, post, for example, uh, so that they also see uh, where you as an operator placed that point. Yes, yeah, really neat tool right there. In my opinion, this is one, the smart inspection that, that will actually become very use, usable in other areas, not just in inspection. I can see this, this what we're going to be talking about over the next few slides, very, very helpful also in public safety. So for, for example, now we have the ability to set uh, really a tremendous amount of waypoints, uh, up to 65,000 waypoints. Uh, I'm curious who will ever reach that, but we have the ability to set a lot of waypoints and really define a, a mission. And it, it supports banked turns and a much more dynamic flight environment. Obviously, this was designed for inspection type of applications where you fly a you know bridges inspection or tower inspection, maybe once a quarter or once every month. And so if you have a waypoint mission set, it will fly the same waypoint mission every single time. And it's also supporting uh, third-party payloads 
or uh, through our uh, mobile SDK or the onboard SDK, uh, additional third-party solutions. And what does that exactly mean? Um, well, let's look at the live mission recording, for example. So while you're flying a mission, you can re uh, record that mission in essence, and um, it will automatically add the actions that you are doing. Like, for example, if you're panning your camera to a certain spot, if you're zooming in, it will record all of that. And after one of those manual flights, then you have that entire mission saved. And the next time it will do not only the flight, but also the camera and gimbal control the way you did it that very first time. Let's see. Um, this here, I think, will be something that public safety is going to utilize as well. So, for example, let's say we, we, we do, in this case, a tower inspection. And if we take individual images uh, zoomed in very close, the, the challenge always is, um, at the end, when you look at a zoomed in picture, is it this arm, is it that arm, is it, which, which one is it? So what it does now, we have the ability, in essence, to select an area of interest. And that could be that entire um, tower. And then it creates sub little boxes, and those little sub boxes are the ones that it will zoom in on. And so you have it in high definition, zoomed in close up. And I can see this for forensics, accident reconstruction, potentially even uh, search and rescue. So oh, can we go back? Because this is the, this is the cool part. Um, we, we, we have the ability to draw that, that little box around and adjust the box to fit whatever need we may have. And then it will calculate um, how many uh, sub-images it will take with the zoom camera. So obviously, this is another beautiful way to use the wide angle lens and the zoom camera in the background, in essence. Um, so let's go, let's go forward a step so that we can see so we're creating this box, we can align this box and, uh, and then take an image and it will take an image of all those different little boxes at the same time. You don't have to do individual images. And the nice thing is um, you can then look at the end product as a wide angle view with the box and you, can, you, you immediately know which zoomed in image belongs to which piece. And the next time you go to this particular tower, you can just redo the exact same thing and it will take the same image again. So you have, in essence, uh, the same type of view that you can do over a period of time and really do good comparison models. Obviously, as I mentioned, in 2014, when we did the, the initial SDK, the uh, M300 is also supported by the mobile onboard and payload SDK. And most of all of that has already been made available uh, as of yesterday, and um, we, uh, if you're a developer, you already have access to, to those updates. So uh, we will be seeing a lot of really good solution enhancements that will come out um, to, thanks to the ability of the SDK uh, access. And a lot of questions come up with, okay, what, what will be, what third party, uh, uh, solutions will already be available through the payload SDK. And here are uh, some of the ones that, that are already available. Uh, obviously, we have the Spotlight. That's going to be still a very, very useful tool because now if you have the dual gimbal plate, you can have Spotlight on one and you can have your H20T on the other and, and you will have light, thermal, zoom, visible uh, and laser rangefinder. And on the zoom camera, you still have IR cut, so you, you have a tremendous amount of sensors and capabilities uh, available on, on one uh, platform for both day and night operations. Yeah, and um, I kind of wanted also just to hit on this briefly. Well, I know we're running out of time here, but um, just I wanted to, to let folks know, especially, you know, uh, those of us in public safety where, you know, DJI, um, uh, those of you who don't know me personally, I'm also a firefighter full time with Southern Manatee Fire Rescue. And uh, a few years ago, uh, we started working with DJI as technology partners. And uh, one of the great things about that, and the reason I wanted to bring this up and show you a few things, is just because, just to show how how far 
uh, DJI is going and, and willing to go to, to learn what the technology is that we need as an end user, uh, you know, me specifically in the fire and the hazmat side. And then, you know, other agencies with law enforcement and stuff, they have a lot of the same type of agreements, but uh, they, they want our input. They want our feedback and how, how we can use these systems. So we, we had a, uh, a, a little bit of time to work with DJI with this system early on, and we were extremely impressed with it. And when we did some of our uh, training that we did with um, some water injection training uh, for uh, liquid propane types of uh, emergencies and stuff. So if you can go to the next slide there, I'll kind of just show you. Um, this is the thermal camera on this one, which is really neat. And as you can see, I, I know that, you know, we don't have the MSX feature on this system. And we've been hearing some people ask about it, but um, we do have a side-by-side -side view that allows us to see the thermal and show the visible light simultaneously. The, the It's looking a little choppy on this as you guys are watching, but I can tell you it's it's a high-res uh, thermal imager. Um, it's, it's very, very clean, high refresh rate. Tons of different palettes compared to previously. Um, uh, you know, for us in the hazmat side, it's pretty pretty solid stuff. You can see there on that thermal, you can see the liquid line on the propane. So they worked with us for a couple of days, and show, we we did some uh, some videos and some filming and some testing. You know, on the this system, one of the key features that works for us, which we really like, the laser rangefinder was important for us, especially from a hazmat perspective, to be able to lay out. Our, uh, our distances from objects, uh, for, you know, if there's a, an emergency, a, a leak, a spill, an object, we can use that laser rangefinder to, to see how far we are from it to set up our hot, warm, and cold zones, um, you know, and then just be able to track our guys. And it just makes it so much easier from a pilot's perspective and a command perspective to be able to see their people, see what's going on, and have all this different type of uh, sensors available to us. Um, so that was that was a lot of a lot of fun working with them on this this system when they came out to us and um um you know i don't know if you had anything you want to add to that romeo but we really enjoyed and be appreciated being a part of the development of this no and i and i think many people out there uh, know me and have have talked to me or have worked with me we wanna and we need to know what the needs are what works what doesn't work and yes uh this is a different platform there is a lot of changes in it is it perfect? Absolutely not. Yeah. There are, like you mentioned, MSX is not on there. A lot of people will be uh, worried about that. Um, yes, it, it is a great feature that we have loved in, in, in on the XT2, on the M2E Dual. Uh, it's not available on, on here because we have additional data sensors available. Um, so it's difficult to meet everyone's needs and expectations but by working together but by learning from each other that's the, the knowledge that i can take back to the team and we can figure out a solution that works and I'm, I'm i'm really looking forward to good feedback constructive feedback um you know it doesn't help me when somebody says well this doesn't work for me why doesn't it work for you? What is it that, that makes your job more difficult or, or not as right. easy as it could be? If that feedback is constructive, you can build on it. And that's why it is so important to work with the likes like Southern Manatee Fire Rescue and other of our vertical partners that are willing to work with us to enable future solutions to meet their needs. No, I agree. And we've, uh, you know, had a had a great opportunity great time working with you guys and it worked really well with building out new systems based around our needs so uh this is just some more information on the specs and accessories um you know we'll, we're going to dive in a lot more of this stuff too after and our, our um our live stuff too so um and obviously the enterprise shield is going to be available for this system as well um the, all the details on the new shield program for this we don't necessarily have but we will have that information for you soon unless you had something to add romeo no. okay um so yeah so that that information will be coming out very soon um and uh you know we had a lot of questions that came up to us and we're going to continue to try to answer those uh on our on our live version after this uh we just ran out of time today but uh you know feel free to scan the code there to follow us and we're going to have um some answers to those questions and answers. I don't know if Ryan, if you wanted to add anything else on this. Yeah, yeah, just uh, no, definitely appreciate everybody joining. Um, the QR code that you see, if you take your uh, cell phone out um, or any type of camera, you can uh, 
take a photo of that. That will uh, take you to all of our social media links that you can follow. As I mentioned, uh, they're getting ready to start the both the Facebook and Instagram live uh, demo. Uh, there was a there was a tremendous amount of questions, and we definitely want to address those um, those that we can address uh, via the the product. Uh, we'll do that during the live demo, and those that are um, not really something that we would address during the live demo uh, per se. That's you know in regard to being able to show you something, but just hear a question, we're gonna go ahead and email those out at a later point. So uh, definitely appreciate everybody attending. Uh, Rich, Romeo, thank you very much for your participation and your expertise in this. And uh, we're gonna go ahead and uh, cut over to the live demo and head out and get that going. All right, thanks Romeo. Thanks everybody for listening up. <laughs> I gotta go fly. <laughs> <laughs>